Hi guys, and welcome to another batch of your replays. We're following the recent format of having one higher tier, one lower tier game in the same video. And we're going to kick off with the higher tier game with Gentleman DZ1991 in the T62A, the tier 10 Russian medium tank. Although this is one of many Russian tier 10 medium tanks, but it's the original. Uh, it's the one that gets less gun depression, but very, very good turret armor. Now, Gentleman DZ is platooned with Intimidator in his E50M, so we've got a two-man tier 10 platoon here. It's a game on Fisherman's Bay, and the teams look fairly evenly matched. Uh, during the countdown to this game, Gentleman DZ said that he was going to be pushing the 1-2 lines, which, to be perfectly honest, is not something I would you know, usually recommend unless it was done in strength. Uh, usually on this map, what tends to happen is the heavies go town, TDs and maybe light tanks go one, two lines, maybe at the odd medium, and then medium and light tanks patrol the middle around, around the E line. At least that's the way the game usually goes. But Gentleman DZ decides during the countdown he's going to push the one, two lines. He's communicated that to his team, uh, and uh, it looks like his platoon mate is going to be helping him. And it's a good thing that they do, because uh, this is a very, very hard fought victory. Not giving away any spoilers there. It is going to be a win, but it is extremely hard fought, uh, which is why I like the video, which is why I decided to put it up. Um, it's a very interesting game. Uh, E50M, decent gun. And as I say, I would normally expect maybe a tank like the E50M or even the T62A to be up on the E line. But uh, as you can see, the medium tanks have gone E line, light tanks have gone E line. Or the Leopard 1 has decided to scout the uh, E line. Uh, but what you're noticing is not many tanks going into town. So on top of that, the AMX CDC and the T49 are hanging back on the 1-2 line. So what's actually happened here is Gentleman has pushed up with his T62A along with his platoon mate. And it looks like the rest of his team are going to be supporting from behind. Which wouldn't be that big an issue apart from the fact that one of the tanks that's supporting from behind is a T110E5. Who really, really shouldn't be sitting at the back of the map and sniping. He is a top tier heavy. He should be in town. So... There is an IS-7 in town, but other than that, it's just mainly uh, Tier 8s who have gone into town, so that side of the map is not looking quite so good. You can see the gentleman knows what he's doing, he's aiming for the weak spots on a very dangerous Fosh 155, waits for the 155 to fire, yep, he pulls out, takes a shot, waits for the 155 to fire, doesn't get another shot. But uh, T-62A, mainly known for its turret armor. The hull armor is okay on flat ground, but what you've got here is the IS-7 shooting down and gets a very, very good shot into uh, Gentleman before he can pull back. But because the uh, IS-7 is fired, Gentleman's able to pull out, get a shot, and he knows that the Fosh 155 is probably on a reload for the next minute or so. So, uh, unfortunately... The team's uh, AMX 50B got into get it, got into a little bit of trouble, but uh, you can see gentlemen and uh, what's the uh, platoon mate? Sorry, Intimidator. They are kind of stuck here. Oh, dangerous, dangerous, dangerous! Fosh 155 is back and reloaded. Puts a big shot in the E50M. E50M is trying to side scrape, but as I say, it's a good thing that. Intimidator and Gentleman came this flank because the top tier heavy on the enemy team, the IS-7, very good player, also came this flank. And had these two medium tanks not been here, as I said, normally you would expect them to be in the middle, but had they not been here, it's a very good chance that the IS-7 and friends would have pushed this flank heavily. I mean, there's a Panther 88, a VK 4502A, an AMX 5120, a Fosh 155, an M103, a T62A, uh, they're, and the IS-7, they all came this flank, so had these two platoon mates not been here, it could have been a raffle stomp. And that E-50M, again, these tanks, they're suffering a little bit from gun depression. You've got to be careful because the Fosh 155 definitely has reloaded. He's still down there. Um, yeah, but that top tier heavy T-110E5, really, he could have gone somewhere else. But um, thankfully, someone took out the IS-7. Now, what this means is that Gentleman is able to use this IS-7 to defend himself, to protect himself, and someone has killed the Fosh 155. You can see that Gentleman is getting the assistance damage here because he's on the front line, he's the one doing the spotting. 
But uh, Fush 155 is probably the most dangerous tank down here. He's been taken out, which means that Gentleman and his platoon mate, Intimidator, have got a little bit more freedom. There's a couple of Tier 5s and an M103 at the back, but Gentleman pulls forward and unfortunately trades shots with the enemy T-62A, but you can see he's using... Beautiful shot there. He's using the IS-7 wreck for cover, able to poke out as a result. Unfortunately, well, fortunately tracks the T-62A in place, but unfortunately then misses, moves up to get a better shot, goes for another track shot, and now they're being flanked by a Bulldog. T-62A on the enemy team gets taken out, Bulldog is flanking. So this is just such a hard-fought victory. Very, very hard-fought victory. Bulldog gets away with his life. Someone, I think, uh, Gentleman was the only one who managed to put a shot into the Bulldog, but M103 is on low health, Bulldog's on low health. Uh, Intimidator gets tracked and then taken out by a Panther 88, unfortunately, but... Now, Gentleman's going to be using his five degrees of gun depression. He's got to use the slope to his advantage to try and get shots here. Try and work the poor gun depression on the tank. There are tanks with worse gun depression, but the T-62A is definitely not as good as the Object 140 when it comes to gun depression. But it does have good turret armor. And that's the second kill in quick succession for Gentleman. He takes out the Bulldog. Going to work on the VK, takes out the VK. Unfortunately, he's just gotten ambushed by a CDC. And the CDC is putting shots into his lower glacis, even though the frontal armor on the T-62A is okay. Maybe the CDC would have had problems pinning had it been flat ground. Unfortunately, Gentleman was reversing down the slope, gave a weak lower glacis. Um, and you could see that they're not too happy. Uh, they've lost the town, they've lost the middle of the map. Things are going badly, they're losing 8-10. Uh, unfortunately, they're not happy with the, all the tanks that decided to camp the 1-2 lines. Now, why is the T-49 camping there? Admittedly, the T-49 is... It's not exactly a scout, even though it's a light tank, it's not exactly a scout. But in a situation like this, you really, really needed the T-49 to do some spotting for the team. And support maybe the middle of the map, support the town, but it didn't happen. Uh, the T-125 has finally decided to stop camping and move forward. But again, the, the questions have to be asked. Why wasn't the T-125 in town as top tier heavy? Or why was he being so passive? Uh, you've got to be aggressive. You've got to be far more aggressive when you're in a top tier heavy. Your team is relying on you to tank damage. Now, unfortunately, Gentleman has used his repair kit already and his gun has been damaged. But you can see how hard fought victory, or how hard fought this game is going to be. There's a CDC that's flanking. The Leopard that was in the middle has retreated back into the corner. The Spatchat is a very, very dangerous target. And I think Gentleman recognizes that fact. He's focusing on the Batchat. Now someone is capping. The E5 has moved up. Gentleman, a Leopard, and an E5 are the only tanks left. And the Leopard is relocating from the corner. So still some very, very dangerous tanks left on the enemy team, and one of them is that Batchat who's reloaded, has come back from war. Thankfully he gets taken out by that E5, but that means more damage taken, so... Gentleman is now on 258 health. He really can't afford to make any mistakes now. Um, the Leopard and the E5 are doing good work, they've just taken out a 120 and a 1390, but the E5 goes down. This 121 is a two-hit kill for Gentleman, and Gentleman can only afford to take one hit. So he's trying to stay safe. They're being capped. There's 45 seconds left before the cap happens. Uh, and it has to be. It has to be the E75 that's capping. The 121 is in the corner. Leopard thankfully takes out the AMX FDB. Leopard is on five kills. Gentleman is on two kills. Both these players are having very, very good games. You can see the gentleman is up to 4.4k damage so far. As someone capping 20 seconds and gentleman has got to risk it, he's got to risk it, he's got to go. He resets the cap, resets the cap and bounces the 1-2-1. One, one. Leopard can now focus on the E75 but gentleman needs to get into cover. He is a one hit kill, got a little bit lucky. And the 1-2-1, one, one, very dangerous tank and thankfully they 1-2 him so 
gentleman manages to get a shot in just before the leopard finishes him off. That means that he's up to 5k damage, just one tank left. E75, bounces the first shot. Reset, or the leopard has reset the cap. Now, this is what I've talked about in previous videos. This E75 decided to cap. He could have moved up, he could have supported teammates, but he sat there in cap. Rather than attacking, he basically cost his team the game. Um, yeah, he could have moved up, 1-1 one one was in trouble, enemy tanks or friendly tanks were in trouble, and the E75 decided he was going to sit there and cap rather than trying to support tanks. Even when it was a 1 versus 2 situation, rather than trying to move into cover, the E75 insisted in sitting in the cap. Uh, and a lot of cappers do that. Um, he could have moved down to the rocks, he could have tried side scraping. Uh, both these tanks weren't on the best of health. Uh, well, I suppose the Leopard was still on a thousand health, but definitely, gentlemen, was on uh, one-hit kill st uh, levels, so the E75 could easily have advanced, could easily have tried to take out uh, the uh, gentleman DZ if he had uh, not wanted to cap, but yeah, capping, it's not great, guys, it really isn't. Only cap when there is a chance, or there's still a chance of losing the game. So gentleman picked up an ace tanker for that game. He also picked up his first mark of excellence, so it's obviously a fairly new tank for gentleman. Uh, he also picked up a defender and a confederate, and it was a very, very hard, hard fought game. It could have gone either way. Mistakes by players from both sides towards the end of that game meant the game could have swung either way. Uh, but gentleman finished top with 5k damage, two kills, and 1249 uh, experience. Even though the leopard had an amazing game as well, 6k damage, seven kills. The Leopard was basically shooting tanks, other people were spotting for him, so the Leopard wasn't getting any assistance damage. In fact, all the assistance and all the credits, or the XP and credits he was earning, was being shared with the spotters, uh, one of whom was Gentleman, and uh, Gentleman ended up earning 4,505 assistance damage because he was on the front line, because he was aggressive. Uh, you get more XP and more credits by being on the front line and being the one that spots enemy tanks. Uh, the, for example, as I say, the E5, even though he ended up having a semi-decent game, he did 3k damage, 4 kills. Um, again, a lot of his XP was taken away from him because he was playing incredibly passively for a top-tier heavy camping in the corner. Uh, if you're top-tier heavy, please don't do that. Um, but uh, Gentleman finished up with uh, 29 shots, 23 hits. Uh, he had a huge amount of damage, very, very good, very well played. As I say, normally you don't see medium tanks going the 1-2 lines, but at the beginning of the game he indicated he was going to do that, and it was a good thing he did. Uh, I think he and his platoon mate being on the 1-2 lines meant they were able to win this particular game. Uh, he did 87 base defense points and earned 7,000 credits with a standard account, so he wasn't firing very much premium except at the very, very end. Uh, so yeah, very, very, very hard-fought victory, very good game, really, really enjoyed that. When I was first watching that, I was wondering, yeah, the game could swing either way, but uh, really, really good contribution. Uh, so, uh, moving on. Next up, we've got Baron SF in the UE57. Now, this is a tank that you either love or you absolutely hate. Uh, why do you hate this tank? Well, it doesn't have a lot of engine power. It chugs along. Um, it's okay when it gets up to speed, but the acceleration is not amazing. Uh, uh, but when it does get up to speed, it's quite fast in a straight line. It turns incredibly badly for a tank or tank destroyer. It has incredibly bad traverse speed. It has incredibly bad gun depression. In fact, I don't think it has any gun depression whatsoever. It has bad gun elevation. It has a very, very narrow gun arc. Um, and it has absolutely no armor and it only weighs about two tons, so anything, absolutely anything, can basically ram the UE-57 to death. So why? Why would you want to play this tank? What could possibly, what could there possibly be that anyone likes about the UE-57? Well, it's also one of the smallest tanks in the game, so that makes it a very, very small target and hard to hit, and it's also got the best camo rating in the game, or at least the, I think it's got the best camo rating in the game off the top of my head, especially if you've got a camo crew and camo net. Uh, but another thing, to, you, or another reason to maybe to love the UE57 is the fact that it gets a six pounder. As you can see, it's a 57 millimeter, but in other words, it's a British six pounder. And that six pounder means, come on, pop up again. It gets 110 millimeters of penetration and 75 damage. So, very similar penetration to 
higher tier tanks that are using the six pounder and 75 damage is not bad so you've got a high rate of fire the accuracy is not amazing it's a six pounder but what you can see is very very high rate of fire and very very high dpm as a result even though your alpha damage is not great now why does this get a british six pounder well even though it's a french tank this tank was actually designed and developed in britain it was des designed and developed in England in 1943 by the Free French Forces. So the uh, French troops that escaped from France to fight uh, after France had been occupied uh, designed this tank in 1943. And they designed it, basically they were short on funds, so they de basically designed it out of leftovers. So what we have here is the UE-57 is actually the UE-2. The UE-2 is a tractor. It's an artillery tractor. It's a uh, vehicle that was used for moving artillery in and out of position. So they basically just took an artillery tractor and they stuck a six-pounder on it. Now the six-pounder was surplus because by 1943 the six-pounder was considered obsolete. So there were plenty of six-pounders lying around. So essentially all they did was they took the British six-pounder and they stuck it on an artillery tractor and they called it the UE-57. Uh, as I say, the gun was considered obsolete by that stage, but and therefore the tank was, or the tank destroyer, I should say, was considered fairly obsolete. Nice shot through the gap there on the uh, T-25. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, both the tank and the gun were considered inadequate by the time they were finished the prototype in 1943. So it never got beyond prototype stage, just one was ever, ever built. But um, it's still a very, very dangerous little TD. As I say, if you can overlook the problems regarding gun elevation and gun depression and embrace the fact that it is incredibly stealthy, has a really, really good rate of fire, amazing camo rating, Unfortunately, doesn't pick up a kill on the Panzer 3-4, but uh, yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, this is a tier 3 and a tier 5 game. So Baron has found himself as a tier 3 and a tier 5 game. He's bottom tier, and in fact, the enemy team had more tier 5s than Baron's team. So uh, yeah, UE57, very, very either underrated, you either love it or hate it, like I say. And, oh, that, uh, that T25 on the enemy team just committed suicide, so... Baron is aware that there is an enemy T-34 moving up, flanking him on the minimap, and even before the T-34 was spotted, he was turning around to deal with it. So just an M2 medium, a gorilla, and Baron to deal with the top tier medium tank, T-34. So is this six pounder going to make any difference? Can it pen the T-34? Unfortunately, the medium two goes down. You can see how much of the tank Baron has to ex expose here in order to get shots on the T-34 because the gun depression is just so bad. But it looks as if the T-34 didn't even spot Baron. Yeah, there we go. Baron was sitting in the open shooting the T-34, wasn't spotted. The camo rating on this tank is amazing. But Baron's in a lot of trouble now because the score is 11-13. It's just Baron and Artie versus four enemy tanks. And they're all on high health. But you can see the small profile. It's a tiny, tiny tank. And Baron's in serious trouble here. He's down to 63 health. Thankfully, the gorilla comes to his rescue. Still three tanks left on the enemy team. And as you can see, this tank does not traverse very well. So uh, you, uh, this tank, it only weighs, as I say, two tons. Abs only weighs two tons. So what you're actually doing when you put a camo net on this tank, it increases its weight and makes it slower. When you put binox on this tank, it increases its weight and makes it slower. Putting equipment on this tank makes it slower. But it's worth putting equipment on this tank because, as I say, the camo rating is just amazing and the final two enemy tanks have been spotted, but look at this. SU-85B has very, very poor gun depression as well and Baron's tank is so slow, or so low profile, that uh, Baron is able to take up, take out the uh, or STVZ-39 in the background, is able to go to work. Rate of fire means he can kill the SU-85B without exposing his tank. Such low profile, and the SU-85B didn't have very good gun depression either, but... Yeah, Baron is up to four kills as a tier 3 and a tier 5 game. Just one tank left on the enemy team. It is arty. So, uh, yeah, the enemy team just basically ran in one by one and let Baron take them out, but... Um, yeah, that's not to take away from the fact that this tank can be an absolute monster if you know what you're doing, so... 
Uh, just one RT left on the enemy team. And I think Baron is decided that, you know what, if, if he dies, then there's a pretty good chance they might actually lose the game. So this is a situation where they are capping where the result is not definite. They're not capping for the sake of capping like the first replay. What they're doing is they're capping because there's a chance of losing the game. The enemy RT has got good camo rating. If Baron goes around and basically searches for the enemy RT, he could get shotgunned in the face. And then it would be RT versus RT. There's a chance of losing the game. So here they're capping because it's safer to cap than it is to actually go look for the last remaining enemy. Uh, in the previous game, unfortunately, the E75 decided to cap instead of actually trying to help teammates and lost the game as a result. But uh, there we go. Very, very solid result in a tank that is probably underrated. Uh, as I say, you either love it or you hate it. So Baron picked up an ace tanker for that game. He also picked up Confederate and High Caliber. Good job, especially as a tier 3 and a tier 5 game. But the Renault UE57 can do things like that. The camo rating is absolutely amazing. The gun is very, very good. Remember, it's a 6-pounder. I mean, there are tier 4s, tier 5s that get the 6-pounder. And this is a tier 3 that has it. So uh, very, very nice damage. 1576. Uh you know, three times the damage that the next highest player on his team did. Um, incredible damage game for a tier 3 and a tier 5 game. Four kills and 1141 XP. Very, very good result. Uh, Baron fired 42. He only hit 27. So the one bad thing, even though the six pounder is a great gun, is it's not exactly a sniper. However, the rate of fire means that you can afford to miss shots. Um, so yes, you can use it as a sniper, but don't expect to hit all the shots. The accuracy is not amazing. Um, uh, but very, very good damage. He uh, damaged 10, destroyed 4. He didn't spot anyone, and that's because you've got to play this tank so passively. It's got absolutely no armor, very few hit points. It's a tier 3 after all, and it's a TD, uh, and it can be rammed to death incredibly easy. So it's a very fragile machine. You've got to play it passively, and that's what Baron did. That was a showcase on how to play the UE57. Um, so he did 145 assistance damage, uh, 70 base cap points, and finished up again without a premium account. Finished up with 15,000 credit profit with a standard account. Wasn't his first game of the day, but uh, yeah, UE57. Interesting, interesting little tank destroyer. As I say, uh, only one was ever built. It was a prototype and it was basically just an artillery tractor with a uh, six pounder uh, that was mounted on top and it was already considered obsolete when it was built, which is why it never made it beyond prototype. But uh, anyhow, uh, that's it. I want to thank Baron and I want to thank uh, Gentleman for sending those replays in. I hope you guys at home enjoyed watching them. As per usual, this is a 4K video, so uh, I'm going to be giving out a couple of Steam games with this particular uh, video. All you need to do is leave a comment in the, uh, or just leave a comment, leave a comment and you'll be in with a chance of winning a Steam key on a future video. Anyhow, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time.